My name is Catherine Arndt and I'm the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. I hope you enjoy today's Connect episode brought to you by the VLGA, the national broadcaster on all things local government. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to VLGA Connect and the first in our state election series for 2022. We'll introduce our panellists to you in just a moment. But firstly, I want to say hello to my co-facilitator, who will do a more formal welcome for you from the VLGA, the CEO, Catherine Arndt. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Chris. Uh, looking forward to um, kicking off with what is the first program in the VLGA state election series. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge uh, the VLGA President, Councillor Denise Massoud, and um, without putting um, Denise on the spot, I'm not sure if she would like to do the welcome to um, acknowledgement of country. Acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from where we are all coming from today for this meeting, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also to any Torres Strait Islanders who may be present today. Thank you, uh, Councillor Massoud. I would also like to acknowledge all of the other elected representatives who are in the room today uh, from local government. I will hand back to Chris Eddy now who can introduce our guests more formally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And I do invite our, pa our participants in the audience to use the chat function today for your comments and questions for our panellists. Catherine and I will lead our panellists through a few starter questions, but obviously we'd like you to be part of the conversation as well. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to introduce Richard Reardon, who is the member for Polworth and the Shadow Minister for Local Government. Good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon, Chris, and to Catherine and Denise and to your guests this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And I think that's a local background picture there that you're sharing with us, which looks delightful. Yes, the Great Lake Colac, largest open body of fresh water in Australia, proudly sitting here on the banks, and it's great. Excellent. Uh, just keep your feet uh, dry there, uh, Richard. It looks like you're floating on the water. And we've got uh, Ryan Smith with us as well, who is the member for Warrandyte and the Shadow Minister for Planning. Good afternoon, Ryan. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Great to have you both with us, and we'd like to just work through a few issues for the sector and get your thoughts on, you know, what would happen if we had a change of government in November? And perhaps <clears throat> if I can start with you, Richard, from a local government perspective, what will your priorities be as a Minister for Local Government, should that happen? Um, look, I've got two main priorities, and um, I've been in this role now for about eight months, I think, and. Um, travelling around both rural, regional, uh, city and other municipalities, and also meeting quite extensively with the ratepayer groups who I know are often the bane of council's lives, but you know they are a segment of the community that are engaged pretty heavily with um, what's going on at local government. Um, to me, there's two big elements we have to do. We have to um, seriously look at reform of governance um, and the way our councils operate and work. And, you know, as we sit here today, well over 10% of our local government um, municipalities are in some sort of strife with monitors or, or commissioners. Um, that to me is a, a sign of governance failure. And we sort of have a situation where there, there seems to be a disconnect between what the community thinks their local government's responsible for and, and what local government knows it's responsible for. And we, we need to we need to work with councils and council laws and also better educate the community about what their councils are responsible for. And so I've broadly put that under the portfolio of codifying and being much clearer about what local government's for. And most importantly, working with the sector and those that want to get into it. Because the thing that often gets left out of this, and you know, I, I've been in a heavily sort of involved as a watcher of local government for a long time, well before my time in parliament, um, people want to beat up on councillors a lot and blame council, you know, they're this, that and the other. At the end of the day, our councillor cohort across the state are local people who are essentially not volunteering, you know, they get a small remuneration, but it's not a lot. They are people that are maintaining a full-time job, career, a life, whatever they're doing, and they've decided to give up a heck of a lot of time for the betterment of their community. And that's a good thing. And I think the sector needs more support in making sure the community is aware of that and 
that people can do it well and without the added uh, pressures that have certainly come into the world of politics over the last 20 years, and that's around social media. So I think there's more support for councillors, better understanding of what roles and responsibility are moving forward. And then the issue, of course, that you cannot be outside of metropolitan Melbourne and not know about, and that's about rate equality and rate sustainability and rate fairness. And, um, you know, doing, doing the history on this, um, there's not a lot of things that William the Conqueror brought in back in 1066 that we've decided to keep as a modern day of modern politics. And that's one of them. And it is time that we had a bit of a look at it and we created a system that is fairer and more transparent and one that people can understand. And, you know, um, I'll say this only to my friends here on Zoom now, and I, I can't walk out my front door and say it, but I just got my rates notices here in a mid-sized regional town. And my rates, I've got two properties in town and my collective rate bills dropped $1,000. Now that is just ridiculous. How can you have a system where um, someone who can pay is being asked to pay $1,000 less? And the reason I'm annoyed about this in my particular job is because I know there's gonna be a whole bunch of farmers out there who will open their mail over the next three or four days and their rate bills are gonna to have to have gone up literally thousands and thousands of dollars to make sure that everyone in town's bills dropped. And that's just, and, and I don't need to explain to you people, but that's just the function of based on valuations. It's incredibly inefficient, it's incredibly unfair, and it just makes no sense in this day and age to be having a system that allows you to drop some people's rates a lot and increase other people's rates a lot. So there's work to be done there, and that's my two big priorities, governance and codification and, and um, fixing the rate inequity and, and really coming up with a modern, sustainable system that'll see local government grow and prosper in a fair and transparent way in the future without this endless rate argy-bargy that goes on every year. If I could just add to some of Richard's comments about governance, I mean, we all know as councillors, as state members of parliament and indeed federal, you know, it, trust in elected officials is at an all-time low. Um, we need to have that as front of mind. We need to make sure that all our constituents at a local level and, and otherwise are aware of the reasons why decisions are being made. I think communication is the absolute key. Um, responsiveness is the absolute key. As I say, it doesn't matter whether you're a councillor or a you know, federal treasurer. You've got to be out there talking to everyone and making sure that they understand what you're doing because at the moment that they're all ready to kick every single one of us. And with, I may say, some, some of us, broadly have given the public good reason to think those things. So if if integrity and good governance is in front of mind, then I think we're missing the point as far as our constituents are concerned. Thanks, Ryan. And Richard, we'll come back to you. I suspect that's not the last we'll say today about the rating system. R Ryan, while I've got you, what are your priorities from a planning perspective as it relates to local government if you were in the portfolio? Yeah, well, th uh, just to echo Richard, thank you for having us along. I think I it, I wasn't aware of the depth of what councils did until I became a member of Parliament back in 06. So I'm I'm conscious of the the good work that councillors do, and I do my best to um work with my local council as much as possible because I think everyone's trying to have the same outcome of getting good results for our our communities. Um, I guess as far as priorities go, it's different to different areas of the state. Um, as you get around the state, you see that every different region has has different problems as a priority um, in a city there's of course issues around heritage protection and that's something that we'll, I'll be addressing in a city um, with regards to some of the zoning that's I think um, the neighborhood residential zones that we put in when we were in government that have, I feel has been relaxed uh, a little and causing a lot of angst in those inner city suburbs um, in the outer suburbs where I am around uh, Marunda and Manningham and good to see Susie here um, you know, it, protecting green wedge and making sure that there isn't that overdevelopment as well. And I, if I can say this with, with Susie there, Maroondah's done it particularly well, making sure that we have that high density living in some areas while maintaining um, the leafy parts of it as well. And I think that's an exemplar uh, amongst a lot of councils and that supporting councils to do that, I think is very important as well. Um, the, the biggest thing probably that I'm seeing is just the, the frustration with the lack of speed in putting applications through. And that's from both the council level and, and some councils have addressed it, um, others not so much. I think in uh, cases of rural councils, they probably haven't got the level of expertise that they need to do uh, to, to respond in a speedy way. And I think what I'd like to see and what I'd like to do as planning ministers to give 
have those flying squads reintroduced that were there back eight or nine years ago that, that can go out and assist councils in getting um, those planning approvals done far more quickly. Um, my main aim post the COVID lockdowns is really be, it will really be to get um, investment happening and get confidence back into the business community with regards to putting uh, investment into developments and making sure that we get the services in place that are needed, the infrastructure that's needed before developments are ticked off on. So giving councils a much, much more clear idea about what the state wants to do with every part of state government, with every part of the state. I think at the moment where the state hasn't been clear um, where they want to go with a whole range of different communities, including regional communities and those regional cities, I don't think have had clear direction from the government where they, what, how they should look going forward over the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I want to see some of the more inner city agricultural areas around Werribee and through the southeast protected as well. Um, so I think one of the main, or two of the main things, if I can, if I can say this, is the first is to get things moving a lot more quickly. And the second one is to give a lot more clarity to local government about where my vision and the state government's vision for the state is so that we can all work collectively rather than sort of going off in our different directions. Richard, just going back to your comments about improving governance, that really, I think, leads into the recent culture review project that the state government had initiated into local government. And I was really interested in your views on that project and what you think might need to happen next. Um, yes, look, local government culture review, um, you know, the behaviour of councillors, what someone said to somebody, the politicisation, you know, all these underlying currents that have now had endless media coverage, been topics of conversation for those that care about local government. Um, one of the things that was interesting, I was driving home earlier in the week uh, and Raf Epstein was uh, discussing, I think, the Yarra Council. There was a bit of media uh, earlier in the week on that. And there was the, the proposition put by, um, you know, the MAV, I think it was David Clark they had on and then um, had a couple of CEOs or councillors, might have been mayors, rang and sort of saying, oh, well, we, you know, it's important that we have prepared questions and that, um, you know, that we orchestrate things and that we don't put false information out. And Raf Epstein basically ran the line, well, you're politicians, you know, you're elected by the community, you ought to have opinions and you ought to be able to say things. And yes, you will make mistakes. And yes, things will be done incorrectly. Uh, that's politics. You know, Ryan and I live with that every day. That's what politics is. Um, we have to have a system where it's actually okay to have debate. And certainly from my point of view on governance, what I have observed in recent years is uh, increasing regulation and compliance and new sets of rules being pushed down on local government that's really becoming counter, counter it's, it's, it's sort of, it's working against the public perception of the culture and environment. And it's been put in for the right reasons, but it's having the wrong effect. And I think um, the opportunity we have is um, how do we allow councillors to be what they're supposed to be, representatives of their community, coming together on a monthly, bi-monthly basis to discuss the issues of their community and put the arguments forward. Now, we all know uh, human nature, things will get corrupted. People will have their political alliances, allegiances, you know, all these things. So we have to have safeguards in. But at the end of the day, people are elected for four years. They rise and fall on what their position is and to the public. And I'm always a great believer in the more sunlight you have on democracy, the more sunlight you have, then people, you know, stand and fall by what they say and what they do in their actions and their words. In terms of this local government culture review, to my mind, the biggest thing that seems to be negatively influencing the way the culture work is, in fact, social media. Now, it's also having a devastating effect, as far as I'm concerned, on public debate at a federal and a state level. We've all seen, you know, the pylons that happen to someone who, you know, just innocently says one thing and then suddenly it's blown out of all proportion and it goes on and on for days. And for, as I said, essentially a cohort of um, part-time politicians, um, that pressure that that can bring on people is very, very destructive. And I think we need, uh, <clears throat> you know, in order to 
start improving the culture that's led to over 10% of the councils having um, some sort of monitoring, um, we've really got to give people more skills in the area. So that to me looks like starting much, much earlier in our advertising and recruitment of councillors, providing much more effective and realistic training, whether it's uh, the MAV does something with, you know, the um, the um, board of uh, the, um, the, you know, the board, Institute of Board of Directors, you know, creates a course um, that, that actually provides some real life experience, helps people understand the skills required in public discourse and, you know, the old rule of whatever you say, once you're a counsellor, everything you say is effectively the front page of the age, you know, that was the old analogy used in politics, and really sheet home to people the power of their words and their language and their actions and behaviours and actually treat people with some degree uh, with a greater degree of respect but give them more responsibility and I think um, that would help. Um, the culture of you looking at essentially what PwC you know talking about leadership experience capability the institutional factors I think there's a lot there but you know it's come to the point we've got to stop writing reports about it and actually start putting some actions into place that might make a difference. And, you know, if I had a magic wand subject to a whole bunch of other things, but, you know, I really think um, by and large, councillors are inherently good people going in to have a go. They need better support. But, you know, the full-time professional politicians like Ryan and I, we, you know, we regularly gather all day, every day um, with like people who we get the support from that's required to, to manage these extra community pressures and you don't get that at local government level. So that's where I'm heading with the culture review. I think it really is about upskilling the cohort of councillors to be better prepared to deal with that extra pressure that, you know. Um, and also, I guess, as part of that culture review, we have to be really clear with the community. This is not just about sitting around a table and deciding whether we're going to fund a, an indoor swimming pool or a or a, you know, another kinder placement or fix up a dog park. Um, council is running big businesses. You know, most, there's not a council now that if, if you, if it, just about every council in the state, if they were a private enterprise, to be on the board of directors of that, you're going to have a pretty serious CV behind you. And we need to get people thinking about that in this whole selection process. And that's why I want to I actually want to draw out the length of time to make people more skilled up to be councillors. Richard, I was just going to ask you that uh, a question on that. Do you think there is a role for the state government to support uh, councils in increasing the awareness of the significant responsibilities of a councillor and doing some sort of community and candidate education campaign when we're leading into into those local government elections absolutely Catherine I think you know there, there'll be some members who become councillors who have perhaps are accountants or you know have some sort of serious management or senior management experience and they'll essentially be able to get immediate accreditation but you know we are a democracy we want to have a system of local government that encourages a whole great diversity of people right so if you've got the person who's had a young family, coming back into the workforce, perhaps hasn't had a lot of experience, may have come from a completely different background without the skill sets of high finance and strategic governance and all those types of things, then we need to put a system in place that allows them to do some training over time. The concept that you get elected and then do a, you know, a four-hour online pick box exercise is just inadequate. You know, my view would be you could actually be running things concurrently over the four-year term that people can seek to get accreditation. Some people might be on a sabbatical and can go flat out for three weeks and get their, you know, an accreditation for local government done. Others might be flat out with a full-time career and only have a night a month. So you could, you know, you could offer opportunities over an extended period of time on a rotational basis that made it as accessible as possible, but really drove home the skill sets, the experiences and the expertise that you need to be a good counsellor. Thank you for that, Richard. And that's certainly something that the VLGA has been advocating for. Uh, and that, that's the implementation of a more robust uh, candidate uh, accreditation type process in the lead up, certainly something a little bit more comprehensive than what we saw introduced 
in 2020. Chris, I think we should probably hand back to Ryan. I know you've got some questions for him. Well, I do. Well, for both Ryan and Richard, actually, and I notice we've got quite a few coming through in the chat, so we'll get to those very shortly. So perhaps um, for both of you, but Ryan, if, if I can invite you to start, what is the relationship between the state and local government going to look like if you're in a portfolio like this and having those direct interactions? Yeah, well, I think as I touched on before, Chris, I think um, the state government needs to firstly give local government a much clearer picture of what their municipality looks like and to help councils um, understand that they're in making planning decisions locally, um, sure, they should be keeping the, the, the character and the amenity and, and all of that with regards to their own LGA in mind, but you know, council LGAs aren't islands. And I think that the state needs to be able to give a picture of what um, they want the collective LGAs to look like and how they all work together. So I would be thinking more about um, uh, council areas in terms of regions and, and giving that idea, giving that clear picture to councils about how they fit in within those regional plans. And as I said earlier, it's not, Plan Melbourne has been really good in, in many ways, but I think as far as the regional city is concerned, there hasn't been really much work done by the state to actually say how those regional cities <laughs> areas and so those those city councils and the surrounding municipalities all fit together in the big picture of the state. So I would like to see the VPA working far more closely with councils on making that picture much, much clearer. Um, so that that's the main thing again, as I said before, supporting councils with their with their planning applications and the and planning approvals and making sure they're done as speedily as possible. But I just see it's such a disconnect between councils and the government at the moment, particularly um, in those regional areas. I've spent a bit of time in Geelong over the last year, and I think that the city of Geelong are getting incredibly frustrated with many of the measures that they're taking to accommodate population growth being either thwarted by government or being disregarded by government or, or overturned by government, um, particularly with, with regards to uh, height limits in certain areas. So we just need to have a far greater partnership and collaborative approach about what the state looks like in totality rather than just metropolitan Melbourne and little regard for what's happening outside of the tram tracks. And Ryan, there's been a lot of talk about reforms to the planning system itself. What's, what's your approach to the need for reform of the system? Oh, it, 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 it's needed to an incredibly great degree. And I just look at uh, Peter's questions come up about PSPs. I think we need to really put some clarity around what councils are there to do and what the state government's there to do. So with regards to um, pre-string structure plans, I don't think that the state needs to continually come in at the granular, le granular level and keep um, making comments about design features and things of that nature. Once a PSP has been approved by state government, it's really down to council to take it to that granular level and doesn't need continual input from the state. Uh, which just slows things down enormously, gives no confidence that things are going to move forward and just really discourages investment in, in areas. I mean, I've spoken to developers that just say the whole process um, from the state's interference point of view just wants leads them to want to invest in other areas, other states. So if we want to bring back the confidence and bring back the investment, we've got to make it easier. And that means saying, well, these are the hoops you've got to jump through for the state. Once the state's ticked off and everything, we're out of it. Yeah, particularly if we've given council the very clear picture of what we want to see um, in totality, what we want to see, how that particular municipality represents the bigger picture. I just don't see a reason why a state needs to be involved at that at that minute level all the time. Thank you for that. And Richard, uh, same question about the relationship that you would foster between state and local. We all know about the agreements that have been in place, but haven't really been uh, effective or used or um, uh, front of mind. What would your approach to be uh, to, to the relationship with the sector be? I, I guess fundamentally, the sense I get is that we have a relationship now that's very state pushed down. You know, um, I look at um, municipal uh, strategic plans and visions and wish lists that are all you know flooded my way at this time in the lead up to election and they're all like reading from the same document you know um i <clears throat> received a very uh unflattering response to my uh address to the m9 the other day where i sort of said well you know i'm reading all these documents um i want to know you know, 
local councils, local government, local municipalities are responsible for looking after their local communities, their local priorities. Um, these are driven by the, the vibe of the community and every community you go around has a, has a different vibe. You know, some are more artistic, some are more basic. You know, everyone has their, their different cultural elements to their municipalities. That's what drives their local communities. Our local communities are driven by economic factors. So they're agricultural, they're commercial, they're coastal, they're tourism, whatever. These are the things that need to be front and centre of councils. And when I turn up, as I did to G21 recently, the M9, um, and, and take both G21 and M9, for example, I, you know, if I offend someone, you know, please forgive me. But, you know, both those um, presentations, day-long episodes, I did not hear mentioned once. What was driving those communities? What did local council want from government to help keep those communities vibrant, alive and growing um, economically? Because at the end of the day, everything collapses if we don't keep that working. And so, for example, um, when I said to the M9, I, I got a great long list of $20 billion tunnel going from Box Hill to, to wherever, um, batteries all around the city, all these things. And I said, well, hang on a minute. 40% of your buildings are empty. Uh, people have deserted the city. Hardly anyone's turning up to work. I walk as, a, as an occasional resident in Melbourne through the streets and there are homeless people living on the street in every single corner of the CBD at the moment. I said, as a first world Victorian, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that my capital city of one of the luckiest, richest places in the world has prioritised billions of dollars on all sorts of things that are nice and not unimportant, nice, but we haven't managed to get that part of it right. We haven't said to the, you know, literally tens of thousands of people that operate little coffee shops and things, how are we going to keep you and your families and people and the vibrancy in the city? None of that was mentioned. And I go down to Geelong, and once again, we had a whole bunch of big macro issues being discussed at council level, and yet, what overwhelmingly is bigger than tourism, bigger than the government sector, bigger than anything else in the Geelong region is its agricultural value add, whether it's through the port or the grains or the wool industry or whatever. And it wasn't mentioned once, nothing mentioned at all about that. And, and I sort of just feel, I want councils. They are such an important, you know, they, they, they keep telling us they're grassroots and they absolutely are. And you know, they have a primary role to be feeding that information back up to the state government to be telling us what we need. To think that, you know, for an example, um, the, the uh, Tasmanian ferry has moved to Geelong. Mm. And it doesn't get mentioned at all to me that we've got no traffic lights, no road intersections, nothing that will connect this marvellous new economic connection for Geelong and Victoria in regional Victoria. And it doesn't even rate a mention as a priority uh, for Geelong and yet you know there's all sorts of other bigger macro issues so I want to see a much more functional and practical relationship that drives what's important in your local community and you're not spending time responding to what these bigger picture you know these big pictures are important but at the end of the day local government's there to make sure that the local communities and local people have what they need to function and grow and prosper and provide the other services. Thanks, Richard. I, I could probably dig into a few bits of that, but uh, well, I do want to get to the audience. And Catherine, mm. we've got a few questions coming from our, our participants. Uh, we do. Thank you, Chris. Look, I might ask Councillor Denise Massoud just to talk to her question, if she doesn't mind. It, it's, it's quite a long um, bit of text in the chat. So, Denise, you're on mute, but if you could um, talk to it, that would be great. Thank you. So this is a planning thing, Ryan, you might be interested in. And earlier you talked about how well managed the trees and everything were in Maroondah. I think we do it well in Whitehorse and we've got beautiful Blackburn Lake, which of course is surrounded by trees and absolutely well managed, undergrowth is managed. Um, but it is a bushfire prone area, according to the state government. And in August 2020, without any consultation, the government put through change to the planning scheme which allows a resident to go and remove trees um, any trees within 10 meters of the building and so we've now had a couple of residents who've um, clicked into that and applied and council can't prevent <coughs> the community are horrified and it seems that 
the legislation was clearly done as a one size fits all. And I can see it's sensible in rural areas, but we're talking about metropolitan Melbourne. We don't have bushfires. And the fact that we could actually just have all the trees around that sensitive area removed, the community are, in, are outraged. Yeah, no, it's very sensible. You'll forgive my affection for Marindra. I have been a resident there for 35 years, so <laughs> I have uh, seen it develop very in a very um, very good way. Anyway, white, white horse is also very lovely. Uh, look, I think to, to go to your question, there has to be a common sense approach, which just isn't there at the moment. Your examples are, you know, around Blackburn Lake is, is absolutely right. There's no reason why you should have um, a, a nod towards bushfire issues in White Horse. It's just not. It's it's just a ridiculous proposition, frankly. Yeah. Um, I want to look at all these things with regards to, to bushfire management and overlays because, I mean, of course, they're important in areas such as Nillimbik and, and parts of Manningham and, and so many other areas around the state. Um, but we've also got to, you know, we want to protect, you know, primacy of life is our first consideration and should be, um, but it can be taken to the nth degree. I, I know of... Um, of uh, conference centres and, and tourism destinations in the Yarra Valley, which just simply can't get insurance anymore because of these overlays, which means that they they either go forward uninsured um, because the premiums, when they can get it, the premiums are more than half the value of their property. Um, so they they either don't get insurance or they they just have to close down because they're unviable to make those sort of payments on a, on a yearly basis. So I think we, we, we have to look at safety, but we do have to look at common sense. And I think that common sense has been missing in planning decisions for some time. Um, I, I take the, um, you know, from my history as environment minister, where I was given a lot of briefs from the department and things of that nature that I used to spend a lot of my time going and looking at things myself and actually um, getting an understanding by being in the environment that, that I was being briefed on. So I think that's as planning minister, I would look to do, do something similar and make sure that I would go um, to the areas and make sure that we made planning reform that was that took a common sense approach. Thanks for that, Ryan. Uh, Richard, there is one here for you from Benalla. I know when you uh, spoke at the beginning of, of the session, you talked about the rating system. Uh, Benalla is asking how you would make the rate system fairer without councils losing income. So, yes, good question. Um, Unfortunately, from the confines of, of opposition, we don't have the you know 400,000 um, state government public servants to do all the machinations. We have you know two and a half people in our office who've got to answer um, constituent calls. However, we do have access to the um, to the parliamentary budget office, who have done um, work for us in terms of modelling. What we know is that um, across the state. Uh, you know, there's a lot said about the inequity in rates. At the end of the day, people um, are not paying wildly different amounts. Um, but what we haven't got is a situation where um, the system's fair. So what happens at the moment is agriculture as an industry is taxed a lot more than um, a, a similar producing business that only uses a little bit of land. So we're basically deriving all our income um, to, to fund the basic community services in our state. So this is the footpaths, the local roads, the public toilets, the safe walking paths, a whole range of important grassroots health and primary services that many councils operate. We're sort of funding that on an archaic notion that if you own a lot of land, you've got a lot of money. Now, we don't do that in any other tax in the country. This is essentially a tax and the tax needs to be fair and transparent and the tax needs to be understood well by the community so that, and, and over time, it needs to grow with the economy. Um, what we don't have at the moment is many of those key features of what makes a good tax. So how do we change the tax? Well, at the moment, both federal and state government then throw in a whole bunch of money uh, on top of the rates that, that come in to try and overcome some of these anomalies. So that to me, in tax terms, a lot of churn, it's a lot of double handling. It invariably becomes out of whack over time with demographic changes and so on. So what we want to do, it was what I would do, is if given the chance over and over, we will go right back to basics, strip it right back. At the end of the day, councils need a 
guaranteed way of doing the basics, which is why I said at the very start, we go back to codifying what councils are doing. You know, you've got your local roads, you've got your basic services and infrastructures. We need a system in place that manages that. It, it's, it's actually, it's a bit like my example of, you know, we want to build a tunnel under another tunnel under the city for another train, but we've got a whole bunch of people that aren't living in homes. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that if you live in the most wealthy, prosperous areas in the state, you get to have safe roads for your children to drive on. But if you live, the further you live from Melbourne, the less chance your children will be driving on safe roads. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that in my municipality along the Great Ocean Road, um, we're spending nearly 10% of, of the towns of the, of the municipality's revenue base on keeping public toilets clean uh, for visitors who don't even live or pay a rate in the community. Uh, it doesn't make sense that when um, my, I've got to take my mum who's got cancer down to St Vincent's, I've got to pay $45 a day to park the car at St Vincent's, but if anyone comes to my town from Melbourne, they don't pay anything. So you know, there's all these inequities across the system and we have to have an honest conversation with our communities going, you know, in everything else about service provision in Australia, we accept the fact that there's a bit of cross subsidy across uh, the system. We don't want to be slugging, you know, we have a, a very clear policy of you know, no new taxes and no extra cost to people. We can do both, but it will be about the way we sit down and work out a fair way to ensure all local government can operate. And um, the second part to, to that, just to not go on too long about it, is um, can, municipalities will still have the ability to, to charge extra and do extra things. Because as I said, you've got to accept that every municipality has its own, I call it vibe, I don't know what the technical term is, but now it's got its own um, quirks and nuances that the communities want to keep. And they should be able to keep those. But those um, extras will be clear cut and transparent. Communities can decide whether they're things they want to keep paying for or not paying for. So I think where we're not talking about people are suddenly all going to be getting everything for free, they're not. But we do have to have a system that creates an income stream, a bit like the reforms we saw with the GST, where the states knew what they were getting. And I, I think it's time that we had something that delivered the same return for local government. So we're not sitting here. And as I used the example earlier, where some people get a, you know, on two properties, a thousand dollars saving in one year, knowing full well that a whole bunch of other people in that community will be paying that and more. So it doesn't make sense. And I think there's need for reform in it. Richard, can I just jump in there? Sorry, Catherine. I just want to follow up on something Richard said without prolonging this. A couple of times you've talked about codifying the basics for councils. The flip side of that is there's an assumption there that you think there's things councils are involved in and doing that perhaps they shouldn't be. What does that look like in your view? Okay, uh, unashamedly, um, Ballarat City Council spending, you know, it depends who you want to listen to, but up to $150,000 to come up with an anti-nuclear policy, uh, anti-nuclear weapons policy in Ballarat. Quite frankly, if the people of Ballarat want to spend the $150,000, then clearly identify in the municipal budget that you're going to charge everybody, however much, per household to go and do inquiries into international nuclear weapons um, uh, weapons policies around the world. If that's what's important to your community, there might be communities that think that's important, but you know that money should not be found at the expense of roads, community services, maternity services, whatever those core services are that a community has identified as the not negotiables that are the, the essence of what you've got to supply in your community. And, you know, we can sit here all day and rattle off where councils have gone pear shape on things that, you know, an average person might sit back and say, that's not a core service. And all I'm saying is that the system I'm having is, would, would, would propose is a system that identifies what the cores are, create a funding stream that will allow the core services to be done. And if councils want to put extra charges on top for other ambitions, that's fine, they can. And they, as I said, I believe in democracy and councillors can go to the election saying, well, we charge you all another $200 because we wanted to achieve X, Y, and Z and the community can decide mm. on that. Thanks, Richard. We'll go back to Catherine for some questions. Yeah. Um, just uh, reminding folks that we're due to finish at one. So perhaps brief questions and short, sharp answers if we can, so we can get through as much of this as possible. Catherine. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Councillor Maynard, Mayor Maynard from Wyndham, you've asked a few questions in the chat 
did you just want to pick one of those and, and ask Richard and Ryan? If I can be bold and pick two, one of them is about the culture uh, in the councils and the, the inability of lawyers uh, to deal with such culture. Um, I'd be interested to know what you think. Obviously, uh, you know, the, there needs to be checks and balances, but the mayors need to be able to deal with this sort of behaviour in the chamber uh, and outside the chamber. The other one is about uh, VCAT. You know, um, we uh, as a council uh, have um, our, you know, planning policies in relation to, say, um, you know, light industrial and these sorts of things. We get applications for, you know, cricket, um, you know, businesses and things like this. We say no. Yeah. VTAC says yes. Um, and we're done. All right, so perhaps uh, Richard first on culture and then we'll come to Ryan on VCAT. Um, just quickly on culture, Peter, my view very clearly is that um, culture needs to be dealt um, with common sense and pragmaticness, um, pragmatism, as discussed earlier. You know, we, we need to get a clear understanding that it is okay, it is okay to, for councils to disagree um, how they disagree and, and to the extent they disagree is is a matter of civil uh, of civil discourse and understanding. And I think better training and better management um, is the way to go. Um, and how we manage that into the future, I'm, I'm happy to sit down with with people who have vast local government experience as to what what the realities of operating in a council chamber. I haven't been in one, and certainly, you know, when you talk to groups like this people will have clear views about it. I think it's open for discussion about how we actually solve it at the council or council chamber level. Um, but as a general premise, it is about starting much earlier, providing more, um, uh, more skills to councillors to better deal with the way they go forward. And uh, I'll let Ryan deal with the issue of planning by VCAT because we probably have some hmm. views on that. We are. Um, look, uh, for a start, I mean, the backlog is ridiculous, so that's slowing things down incredibly, and we'd be looking <laughs> to appoint more members to VCAT to try to clear that backlog as quickly as we can. Um, as far as um, them saying yes when you say no and probably vice versa, I think we need... Uh, it'll come with... My experience with VCAT is that they're very black and white. There's no kind of areas for grey. If you're, if, you're, if you're and our, as far as council and state, provisions are in a grey area, then you're probably going to lose a VCAT um, hearing. I think we need to provide the clarity and give the support to councils to make sure that what you want to do in terms of your own municipality's amenity um, is very clear, as long as it's in line with, as I said, the broader state vision. Um, I, I think there's two levels that we can work around with that, but providing councils with the support to ensure that your provisions and all your um, uh, views around planning are very clear and in black and white. And I would say, you know, what we did in 2010 to 2014 was make uh, local government planning provisions kind of the go-to for VCAT to make sure that they considered them sort of over and above everything else. And I would be looking to do similarly, bearing in mind that they're going to be within the parameters of the provisions that the state sets, but VCAT needs to adhere to what the municipality wants. And I would, I would be looking to replicate to some degree what we did when we were in government, which was make the local government planning provisions the go-to for VCAT to make their decisions based on what you have put forward as a local community. Thanks, Ryan and Peter, for those questions. Susie from Maroondra, I'll, I'll hand over to you. I know you've had a couple of questions, so perhaps if you talk to the one that you find, um, I guess, the most interesting for, for you. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, yeah, look, it was probably in relation a little bit to culture, but also uh, Richard, you were talking about it's great if you come in as an accountant or a finance person, you're set as a councillor, but not really any reference to how you might connect with community or having any understanding of some of the key issues that we face. For example, Maroondah has a really high rate of family violence. And if we don't understand, say, the drivers of gender-based violence or hold um, misogynistic views, perhaps, how are we going to help our community? to advance uh, because, as you say, we are closest to community. I think we are, you know, there's a chain coming from, you know, federal, state and down to us where we're doing the stuff down at community level that that isn't happening on other government levels. So my concern is if we just focus on worrying whether people understand the finances when 
you know, for example, Marinda, we've got people that are really into the financial stuff, but we all come in from different angles and bring um, very diverse perspectives on whatever comes to the table. So I think that's important, but I just think thinking that the money is the only thing that's important to council and not worrying about what happens in our communities or how our community is developing or um, that sort of stuff. I, and I think that's a mistake. I just think, yeah, I think we need more training. We just had some discrimination stuff and it's trained, but there's no tick off on are you the sort of person who will discriminate or not, you know? No, Susie, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's not yeah. an either or. We're, we're in a, you know, brief thing trying to keep things simple. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's what I'm talking about, the training. There are a, a huge amount of skills. It's the same in Ryan's and my job. You just can't ever go into public life representing yeah. your community on a one track, you know. We're, we're all over politicians with, you know, one trick ponies. You have to be cognizant of all the elements of your community. I guess I draw on the, the financial thing as an example because that's a very simple thing to do. You know, you can run through a, a simple accounting course to make sure people have some understanding of mm. the types of things they have to be aware of. But I absolutely agree. The course I'd be talking about would be, you know, here's the demographics of our community. These are the social issues. These are the environmental issues. These are the financial issues. You know, all these components and, and that's really to the point that I'm talking about. Council's not just about your particular topic that might have really exercised you to become a oh, councillor. Sure. Sure. It's, it is about all those other things. So you're absolutely right. The opportunity to create, and that's why I'm saying we need to be doing it not sort of six months out from an election. We need to have a system that provides opportunities for people who are interested in being part of their local council to start a training process. And so, for example... Years um, out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for I'd be saying as soon as we have council elections, we should open it up again and start a program because there will be the young person who, you know, young mum or someone who's who's very keen to be involved, but you know, very, very busy, can't cram a course in, in six weeks, you know, give them the four years to to learn about it. Or the person who's just moved back into the district who's only there two years out, you know, give them the opportunity. We want it as diverse as possible because um there's no doubt. The more people you have from different backgrounds sitting around the table, you get a better outcome. We all know that, right? So we need to support that approach. And, and it does, I totally agree with it. it, it includes learning about all the elements. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and just on that training point, and Tony, I might mm. bring you in on to this um, in a minute, but certainly something the VLGA has been calling for, and that is the creation of a really comprehensive candidate training program. We ran multiple uh, candidate development sessions with multiple councils in lead up to the 2020. We were a little bit disappointed that the state government proceeded down um, the route of investing a significant amount of money. And yes, it will be absolutely worthwhile in a program of, I guess, candidate training that only uh, allows for 120 participants and they are all women. And we, of course, think that's incredibly important. And in fact, we need, I think, a pipeline of about 2,000 women to stand in the next elections if we want to get 50-50 uh, uh, parity. But more importantly, all candidates uh, of any gender need to go through uh, this training. So we're really calling for the programs that we've developed. And Tony has certainly partnered with us on a number of these and, and also the induction training that followed the election and also ongoing professional development for councillors. But Tony, you might want to jump in. On yeah, that. look, I, absolutely, Cathy. I think we all agree on what the problem is and it's how do we fix it. But say, I think um, councillors are so busy, what's mandatory gets done. And so the curriculum for that mandatory training, which um, a lot of it was, you know, what does section such and such of the Act say? really needs to go to that, you know, soft skills about how do I deal with losing a debate and um, how do I work across the um, council table? Um, and then, frankly, you know, right back to education and bring back some civics in, in school, et cetera. But um, we're spending a lot of money on resolving it at the back end with monitors and such. And if we could direct some of that towards supporting councils in that um, those soft skills in training um, I think that we, we could really potentially see some changes to that you know that 10% you talked about Richard 
um, we're all aware of it. Tony, I, I guess that's really what I'm arguing as well. It's it's sort of crazy to be, it's it's sort of like, you know, paying for people's lung cancer treatment after they've been smoking, you know, it's the same old argument that the prevention's better than the cure. And um, the reality is going on to local council is not just a last minute whim for a political purpose or outcome. It's a serious job. It's got serious roles. And, and I just think overwhelmingly, people, certainly the councillors I've met and I've had been the councillors in my own family, you know, councillors are good, gen, you know, we've got to start with the premise there, good people who want good outcomes for their community. And, you know, yeah, there's the odd stray rogue amongst us, but there is in every profession and we just have to work with that. And I just think um, better skill people, better prepare them. And particularly in this social media age, better skill people to deal with you know, the, the, the 20 messages you got on Facebook today or on your Instagram, it's not what everybody in the world thinks. It's not the end of the world. Just park it to one side. You know, Ryan and I have to do that every day of our lives. That's just life in politics now. And, you know, just put it aside. Don't sweat. Go and have a coffee. Go out for dinner with your partner, whatever. So um, that's what we need to do. And I think if we invest at the front end, we'll see some real benefits in the overall operations council over time. Uh, Catherine, if I may, there's one subject that hasn't come up and I thought it might, and it's certainly challenging, not just councils, but state as well, and it's nationwide and beyond, and it's the housing issue. And I wonder, Ryan, whether you've got some initial thoughts on how you might approach that and the work that the state and councils need to be doing to try and crack this very difficult nut. This has come up mostly in, uh, well, two areas, but one's inner city, of course, as it seems to be the areas of Stonington and Burundara and the like, are very much concerned about overdevelopment. It's not confined to there by any stretch, but it's, it's what's presenting the most. When the neighbourhood residential zones were, being, were brought in initially, um, the directive, I guess, from state was you can nominate wherever you want to have those zones. And, and I think Stonington and Burundara particularly um, nominated 80% plus of their municipality as having protections and not being able to do anything with. Um, I think the mistake that was made there was not putting on councils the requirement that they're going to have to deal with um, some of the burden of population growth going forward. I think that my approach um, would be to ensure that municipalities put forward to the state their ideas about where they're going to accommodate that population growth and then have the state work with you to provide the services and the infrastructure that's needed for the areas that you've designated as where you're going to have that height that that accommodate that growth in population and that might come down to higher density living and that sort of thing. I'd like to see in broad terms an opportunity for people to live anywhere they want and by that I mean you know a lot of if you're you know born and raised in in uh, South Yarra or Kew or Malvern, the chances that you're going to get your first home in the area where your friends and family are, are pretty pretty minimal for the average person. That's why we see this um, moving out into the suburbs and, and seeing that growth in those um, growth corridors. But I think we need to we need to work as a state with government with state go with local government, I should say, to find those pockets where we can actually accommodate all sorts of types of living to accommodate anyone who's at it, any stages of their life, so they can continue to live in an area or close to an area where they've grown up if, they, if that's what they want to do. So I think working with councils um, to find those pockets where affordable housing can be established. Um, and, and I guess not just for people who've, who've been raised there and want to stay there when they buy their first homes, but also we don't want to price nurses and police and firemen and other service providers out of the market in those areas. So I think working collaboratively between the state and, and municipal levels, we need to, to find those areas where affordable housing can be put. And, and I don't want to do what the current government's doing is overriding local government planning provisions by just saying, well, we don't have to worry about that because we're going to put social affordable housing here and you've got no say in it whatsoever. Um, I think a more collaborative, collaborative approach is needed. Chris, can I just add quickly to that? Please. I'm shadow housing and so we're, we're putting the mechanisms together behind the scenes. Um, I don't think there's an issue at the moment in Victoria anyway, where city and country are so in tune. You know, we're normally at war, but you know, I'm a country boy, you know, we're always new, new, new about the city. But 
Um, <clears throat> you know, this issue is equally shared right across the state. You can be in, in you know, Horsham, uh, Gippsland, wherever, Colac, uh, in the middle of the city, it's the same problem. Uh, rents are out of control. Well, as Ryan said, it's the collaboration between state and um, state and local government on this. And one of the mechanisms that we're going to fast track, this government, as Ryan said, their solution's been to sort of go in and bully neighbourhoods to solve the problem. What we want to do is slightly differently. We're going to put a, um, a, a mechanism in place that will be very, very attractive to long-term investors. And long-term investors can be superannuation funds, they can be church you know, the church groups, if you think about it, right from one end of the state to the other, the church group, traditional church groups, own the best blocks of land on the best corners, closest to public transport. They are ideal. But they will not do the developments at the moment because the structures penalise them for doing anything. So that's something we can fix straight away. Um, you've got not-for-profit groups. You've got philanthropic groups. And, you know, some of the best examples of affordable housing in the state in the last six years has come from philanthropic groups who don't even want to return. They're just happy to do something good with their money. And so there's great opportunities. So what we, I will be doing, and, you know, take in my, my own patch, you know, coastal area where you've got, you know, sea on one side, National Park on the other, and the community wants affordable housing. You've got to go back to the community and say, okay, where are we going to compromise? Because you can't have, we can't have any change, plus we want affordable housing. So it, it, that is the role for local council. It's no good state government coming and telling you what your neighbourhood's going to be look like. That's, to my mind, your job. And that's where we've got to work together. It's a bit like when I said to this, uh, um, you know, Sally Cap and others uh, last week, you know, housing has got to come first. It, it is an absolute essential priority of local council to be instructing the state on how best to do it. The solutions are there. You know, if, you know, the last thing, Ryan, I want to hear is a local, particularly in the country, saying, oh, we don't have any land available. I mean, that's insane, for heaven's sake. It's There's more land you can poke a stick at. In municipal areas, you know, more built-up areas, it's what land can we repurpose, reuse, redevelop? What compromises will the community, can the community live with? So I think there's good news. The work that Ryan and I have put in to date, the industry across those range of opportunities, we believe we can absolutely kick affordable housing's waiting lists and the problems it's causing in our communities seriously, seriously make a dent in it within the first four years after November because there are mechanisms and, and people queuing to help solve this problem. Can, can I just add one more thing? I know we're over time, Chris, so excuse me for this, but in my time as Minister for the Environment, having open communication channels is important. I'll make this commitment to you guys and to, you know, if I'm planning minister, every CEO will have my number. Every council CEO will have my number because I'm tired of hearing over the 16 years that I've been in parliament that councils blame state government for blockages in planning. We do it vice versa. If there is a blockage in a municipality that the CEO believes genuinely that the state's got a problem with, they will be able to pick up the phone to me. Every CEO will get a letter shortly after my appointment, if that's how it goes, with my phone number and instruction to contact me if the state is causing planning issues in your municipality. Now, I'm never going to say that we're going to uh, capitulate to what the councils want, but there will be a genuine open conversation that we will have to clear those things. I, I, my aim is to get things moving as quickly as possible with the minimum of fuss as possible. Thanks for that, Ryan. Catherine, I think we need to wrap up. We are over time. Final thoughts? Look, thanks for that, Chris and Richard and Ryan. One of the things that the VLGA would like to see the incoming government address, and that is the Victorian State Local Government Agreement. There is a Victorian State Local Government Agreement in existence, and it lists the VLGA, the MAV and LG Pro as the three peak bodies that the state government will consult with regularly on any policy matters or any decisions or any proposed legislation that will have an impact on the local government sector. Now, that document appears to have been placed on a shelf in <laughs> somewhere and is not as active and living as we would have hoped. Now, I appreciate that we've just gone through, uh, you know, a time of pandemic and a number of other things and ultimately decisions had to be made quickly, but we really need to, if we are to solve these very complex issues in front of us, we need to work together with the state government and the state government needs to work with local government and the VLGA will be very happy to be sitting around the table and doing just that. 
but I would like to thank you both for joining us today and also all of the guests for taking the time out to listen to the Shadow Minister for Local Government and the Shadow Minister for Planning. And uh, we really look forward to hosting a number of other programs in the VLGA state election series. So keep a lookout for those. We are doing a pre-record with the CEO of uh, Infrastructure Victoria next week. Um, that won't be a live panel, but it will certainly be made available. And it will be interesting to hear what Don uh, Dr. Jonathan Spears has to say in regard to Infrastructure Victoria's 50 year strategy and the implications and opportunities for local government. We'll also be hosting the Minister for Local Government, the Honourable Melissa Horn, on the 16th of September. That will be a live panel. So again, keep an eye out for that. And um, we will also be having a live panel, possibly the week after the 16th, where we'll have all of the chairs of Yes, all of the, um, the peri-urban, the interface group, um, rural councils Victoria and also regional cities Victoria. Chris, sorry, I'll hand back to you. I've, I'm, I'm just yabbering on. We are at time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you again to uh, Richard Ridden and Ryan Smith for joining us. Thank you to our audience for participating this afternoon. This has been recorded and uh, will be made available to members through the VLGA Connect uh, channel in due course. And as Catherine said, please join us for more of our state election series coming very soon. Have a great afternoon and thank you all.